It is none other than Dr. Imtia Suleiman, the chairman and the founder of the Gift of the Givers, uh, international figure. We make dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the strength and the health to carry on with all the good work that he's doing, inshallah. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Inshallah. Jazakallah, Imam, the, the management team, the Salis, those watching from far, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I have no set topic, but I want to share with you experiences that impact on the lives of all of us. Saying things in theory doesn't carry any weight, but making it practical shows you that things can be done, what should be done, and what should not be done. But I want to start off with what, what's worrying everybody. People talk about is there hope for the country? There's corruption, there's crime, there's gender-based violence, there's theft. There's a whole lot of difficult challenges in the country. Now, as Muslims, we don't say, should I leave? Should I go away? Can I make a better life for somebody else? As Muslims, we are there, the bearers of hope. We are there to make a difference. We are there to serve people. And the first example I will give you from Syria. We set up a hospital in the middle of the war zone. And dedicated Syrians came and served in that hospital. The quality of experience in 2011 up till now, they could get a top post anywhere in the world and make enough money and take their families away. And I asked them, why don't you go? They said, we are here to serve our people. Nothing could be worse than a war zone. When hospitals are targeted, ambulance, medical facilities are targeted, and the families of those healthcare workers. But that their commitment to serve made them stay there. As Muslims, what are we afraid of? It is very, very clear. Quran says, and we are taught, that you'll only die when your time is up. Not one minute earlier, and not one minute later. And you will die, even when towers high and far, you try to run away, that will catch you out. So there is no need to fear or to run. Only if you do wrong things, if you have bad things, if you have lack of faith, that makes you be afraid and run away. So as Muslims, we have a responsibility to fix what's wrong. So what's wrong? We say government, we say corporates, we say society, but who makes up all these different entities? It's people. And if you change the system, you can't change the system. You can't control people with laws. You've got to create awareness, mindfulness, and four important principles. Spirituality, morality, values, and ethics. You can have all the best systems in the world. But if you have individuals that don't have these qualities, Nothing will work. And we need to go back to those basic principles. And can it be done? Yes. On Monday, Tuesday morning, there was a glaring example of it can be done and it is being practiced. You see, our office got burgled on Monday morning. When we got there, the door was open, things were strewn all over, the TV, the PCs were taken away. And people say, police are useless. They corrupt. We call the police. They came, the flying squad came flying. And police came from other places. And police from the whole of Western Cape wanted to come. Not only because we are a gift of the givers, but they understood the value of the service that we provide. So in all the things that you think they corrupt, there was goodness in their heart to identify that even if I'm a bad cop, this cannot be allowed to happen. A charity organization cannot be robbed. 
because they understand the value of service, even with their own faults. But the cherry on the top is this. When we announced it to the community, and within an hour, the community responded and said, house number this, that person, that person, that person. The community responded instantly. And the police couldn't believe they could make nine arrests within a few hours. And the same day, everything was captured and brought back. They even captured, they even found the people who stole, who bought stolen goods. So that again raises more issues. You see, on the one hand, you have the thief. But the biggest thief is the initiator, initiator who buys the stolen stuff. So you are the bigger thief. You are the one making the problems. You are the ones to make profit the underhand way. That is a direct insult to Allah himself. Because you are saying, oh Allah, I don't trust you to be the susten sustainer. I don't trust you to provide sustenance. So I steal and I do things the wrong way. That's the direct message that you are giving when you do these underhanded things. And in your underhanded behavior, somebody gets killed one day. Because desperate youngsters go and they take what they want. And in the process, they're surprised by somebody and they shoot and they kill somebody. You are responsible for your underhanded work. I'm a very direct guy. To change the system, change yourself. Corporates keep saying, government's corrupt, government's corrupt. I did 173 lectures last year, speaking to corporates, government, banks, European investors, American investors, the Reserve Bank, everybody. And I tell all of them, you keep guys, guys keep saying, government's corrupt. Who corrupts government? It's the people, the corporates, the business people. Easy to sit back and say, government's corrupt. You are the initiator of that, corpor of that cor corruption. You want to fix the country? Fix yourself first. We have to change that system. I told you on Monday, on Tuesday morning, and on Monday the cops came, and on Tuesday something else happened. But on Monday, the faith in the police service just increases. You see, you have bad and good everywhere. But it's never good to label everybody as corrupt. Everybody in government is not corrupt either. There's a lot of good people in government also. A lot of them don't have the skills, a lot of them don't know how, and a lot of them are blocked. But when you meet them individually, they have the, whole, the, the, the country at heart. A lot of them want to fix the country. They just don't know how. Now, in spiritual terms, my Sufi teacher, who I met 31 years ago, said, I was sitting to him and, talk, and talking with him. And he says, my son, when people do bad, don't focus on the bad that they do. Spirituality is we send positive messages into the atmosphere. So when a person does bad, you try to find something good that the person has done. And you say, you know, you fed, the, you fed the cat last week, and the guys, the light goes on, that you recognize something good in his soul. And you tell him about the dog you gave water to, or the person you stopped on the street and helped. And you said, if you keep doing that kind of positive stuff, the positivity starts growing up, and the negativity goes down and the bad habits go down. On the same basis, we don't judge anybody. You see, I landed up in Turkey for the first time in August 91. And this was a few months post Gulf War. The Gulf War had created this big chasm between all civilizations, all religions, all cultures. The impression was Muslims on one side, the West on the other side. Christians, Jews, and Hindus on one side, Muslims on the other side. I walk into this place, and I see Americans, Russians, Europeans, Germans, people from South America, Australia, India, Pakistan, New Zealand, all over the world, all religions, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, and people who say they don't believe. We have no faith. And they were all there in a Sufi place. And the teacher said, we are not the ones to judge. Judgment lies only in Allah's hands. Our community, we've got great judges. Everybody pronounced on everybody else. Everybody knows a mufti. Everybody knows who's kafir and who's not kafir. We've got a serious problem. What ego, what self-righteousness, and thinking that we know better than anybody else. Those are systems we need to change. So they walk in, so I said then, what's the magic? He said the magic is non-judgmental and love. You see, we read about it. The Prophet said, treat your enemy with love. 
I saw it with my own eyes, on sight, where people from different cultures and different religions were embraced to the extent they wanted to become Muslim. 50% of the people that were Jews there became Muslim. The akhlaq, the character, the behavior was substantially better than any born Muslim because they understood the value of what they found. We don't understand that value. We don't know what they have. And he said, show love. Wherever you go, show love. And then he said, you see, they're from different tariqas. You have different outfits, different colors. So the man with one tariqa with the long sleeves was talking to the man with another tariqa. And the guy from the other tariqa asked the man with the long sleeves, why are you dressed like that? Why do you have long sleeves? So he says, in my long sleeves, in our tariqa, we take the faults of people and we hide them inside here. How many of us hide faults? We find great joy in running people down and exposing the faults of others, of bringing more negativity in the community, of destroying families and people. We don't even check it's right. Force, press forward, forward, forward. Messages go. You don't even read the stuff and you send it forward. You are part of the problem. Youths, old people, everyone, you are part of the problem. You need to change the system and not send anything out. Don't send out negativity. Send out positive things. The Prophet ﷺ taught, admire your brother in public and admonish him in private, quietly. Don't do the wrong thing. How many of us really practice that? Yeah, we go Umrah four times a year, go Hajj every other year, 30 days Ramadan, fast, etikaf, we day all the time. But how many of us practice the principles of real Islam? It's easy to do all those things, I'll be honest. You can fast 365 days, not complicated. To go for Umrah is not complicated. To go for Hajj is not complicated. It's complicated to control the ego and not control the tongue and control the mind. Try practice that and see how successful you are with that. Very, very difficult. So the guy with the sleeves tells the other guy, you got short sleeves. You don't have what kind of jacket you're wearing. So the guy said, I got short sleeves because we don't see the faults of people. Can we practice that? So let's go back to the office burglary. A man and his son come Tuesday morning to the office full of remorse, a parent coming full of remorse with his son. And he says, I am so embarrassed. So I said, brother, what happened? He said, my son bought the stolen goods. And me and my family, no, this is not allowed. I'm a very honest, religious man. All the youth who are responsible for harming the names of your parents, be awake and alert. Because one day, you are going to be parents too. And it comes back. It comes back to hit you very hard. And parents, you need to discipline your kids. The problem is we've lost the value of parenting. So the man comes, and it's very heartbreaking to see this man come here, an honorable man with a beard, elderly, and says, I'm very sorry. We saw all these pictures on social media and realized that it's your guy's stuff, and my son bought it. But he had the courage of his conviction. He had the etiquette, he had the ethics, the values, the spirituality and the morality, and against all embarrassment, he came with the stuff to the office and said, it's me, it's my family, we did it. And he came forward, and then the media were there. Everybody was there. And he said, I will speak to them, to the media. Now that's a very, very brave man. That's a man who's giving examples to follow. And a man like that, it's like all the community around. The community got together, and that's why the police could act so quickly. I was with Minister Becky Seller in December last year. No, November last year. I was in Syria, went in after many years to sort out the hospital and other stuff. And as I finished off there, we got a call from the Western Cape Provincial Government and Police Services. They want us to speak at the gathering of, of the new police recruits they were going to launch for December in the festive season. And the minister was there, and I've been with him before. And what I said, and he said the same thing. You see, criminals fester in society because we protect them. We protect our sons, 
our brothers, our children, our sisters, and our fathers. We are the ones that promote and allow this to happen because we don't stop it. We need to change that behavior. It may not necessarily be stealing and drugs and alcohol. In the more affluent society, it could be about values in business. A lot of us are very puffed up with pride and arrogance. You know, I robbed the insurance company. They only stole two items and I claimed for six. I made money. I'm a sharp guy. I'm clever. Do we allow that kind of thinking to carry on? Do we ever allow a stop and guide our children to do the right thing? So that parent and that son who came, congratulations to you. May Allah bless you in abundance. You've been a loving example of what Islam and Muslims are all about. What humanity should be all about. That you stopped the crime and you came forward. And his son got arrested, by the way. The son got arrested. And 10 other people. And at the kingpin was also caught. This was the value of a father. I want to give you the personal experience, my own experience of the value of a father. You see, my father got divorced and my mother got divorced when I was very young, in Potter's room. Mother came away back to Durban, my father was home, and me and my two sisters bringing up. My father was not a very religiously educated man. He came, there's more religion now. There's more teaching now. There's more Arabic learning now. There's more schools, more Umrah, more Hajj, but there's 10 times more problems than we had before. So something is seriously wrong in the way we practice things. So he was an ordinary man, playing a shop, Monday to Friday, Saturday morning, and I sat with him in the shop. I worked, I was, I was born in Potter's room. I went to school in Potter's room up till 1974, and then I moved to Durban. I used to watch him. He never spoke much. Go in the shop, and black customers would come. And they would buy, and he would sell. And then one day I would watch the black customer would come and say, I can't pay the account. But my family is hungry. And my father would say, give him more stuff. We're not going to get paid for that either. But give it to him in any case. Because they've served their family as well with our business for years. The same member or somebody else would come and say, a family member died. I haven't paid you for account number one. I haven't paid you for account number two. And I need money for the funeral. And he would say, give them the money for the funeral. We're not going to get it back. Now the point I'm making is you see, when you talk to Muslims in general, and when you talk about causes and to support people, the first question they ask you is, can you take zakat? What kind of a dumb question is that? Did you make your money from Palestinians? From Syrians? From Iraqis? From Afghanis? Who did you make your money from? From the people in your own country. That's why Allah allowed you 2.5%. Send it wherever you want. No problem. But you got a choice of 97.5% to support those who made you where you are today. Do we apply our mind? We don't. That's a very dumb question to ask because Islam never said serve Muslim only. Muslim only is hungry. Muslim only is thirsty. Allah slays emphasis on the word nas, mankind. Khairun nas, mayan faun nas. Best among people are those who benefit mankind, not Muslim. And the teacher told me that three times. Remember the word, it's mankind, not Muslim. Not lil Muslimin. He didn't come for the Muslims. He came for all creation. We say we love the Prophet. We like to be like him. We like to follow him. Do we really do that? Do we really do that? No, we don't. We're very selective about what we want. And we take what we want and we leave out whatever else we don't want. Doesn't suit us. Because it's too hard for the ego and the real faith to do that. So my father would do that. He would help the people and he would win the love and the hearts of people in the area. How many of us have dumped our parents? A year or two ago, I got a call from Pretoria. I don't know these people. They said, can you please check? I think it was Sibokang Hospital. My wife is in the hospital. And every time I speak to the doctors, they tell me, no, the machine is not working, some part doesn't come, 
She's there for a long time. She needs orthopedic surgery. She's getting depressed. She wants to kill herself. So I said, let me check for you. And I said, uh, Uncle, don't you have children? Yes, I have children. So where are they? What are they doing? Are they like poor? And they can't manage to help you? No. My children are very well off. So what are you doing in the government hospital? Aren't you on a medical aid? No. My children say it will cost them too much of money to take it off my salary to put their father and their mother on a medical aid. So it's better to suffer in the hospital because you can't, it costs you too much of money to put your father and your mother on your medical aid. Who is the most unfortunate person? The un most unfortunate person, as described by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu is he whose parents are alive and in old age and he doesn't serve them. Eventually, the machine got fixed up. It was broken, it's true. And the part finally did come. And they put it in the lady. And two days later, she died. Do you children want to see that happen to your parents? But parents who do that to their parents, get it back. No matter how old you are, you need to change the system. So my father, I worked with him in the shop. He gave the love to the people. How many of us are obedient to our parents? He's a big man. He's not like 20 years old. He's 55, 60. And the father, his father passed away, my grandfather. My granny tells him that as long as I'm alive, meaning her, and as long as you are alive, your brother and sisters need the assistance. So my father listened wholeheartedly to his mother. And he paid for the sisters. My mother that was divorced from him, he took care of her also. He had that soft, generous heart to take care of people. And for that, he took the blessings. Yes, he suffered a lot. Cancer of the prostate and cancer of the colon. But when you reach that stage, it's a stage of purification. So he served with distinction. He looked after his siblings. He looked after his family. And then it was my time to be tested. Oh, gift of the givers is too busy. I'm flying all over the world. I can't do this, that, and the other. And the call came, your father wants you. So I fly from Peter Marisburg to Joburg, drive to Potter's room, sit with him six or seven days, get in the car. I got two families. Go back, they're missing me. I fly back from Joburg to, to Peter Marisburg, get home, and the call comes. He needs to see you again. So I jump in the plane, in the car, in the plane, the whole process, and I go back to him. It was the three best years of my life. Because the blessings that came from my father who was suffering is unmatched. My sister said, my sister runs an Umrah company, travel agency. And whenever she could, she could take, me, take my father. And she said, one day, the way he was praying, I thought he had no other children. The way he prayed for you. It's not about self. It's explaining to the youth the importance of respect to your parents. The importance of stop putting everything else down. Because it's not my instruction. I'm not telling you my words. These are not my words. I'm not some great prophet or something. These are words from Allah himself and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those are the words I'm telling you. We can't speak our own words. And when you do that, you will see the blessing of what will flow. And the week before he died, I told my family, he's going to die on the 21st of February. And they said, how do you know that? I said, because my Sufi teacher died on the 21st of February. My father died on the 21st of February. My mother was born on the 22nd of February. Everything has a special spiritual significance. Brothers and sisters, I'm not here to put fear into you. I'm asking us to correct our lives. This life is very temporary. It has no meaning. And what matters is how successful you are in the year after. Talking about ethics and values, I want to give you a few examples. You see, I have a very mixed team. Christians, Muslims, Jews, everybody's mixed up in our medical teams. We don't see race, we don't see religion, we don't see color, we don't see practices. We only see one thing, serve human beings unconditionally. So we get into Haiti. We make world history. Eight days after the earthquake, 20th January 2010, we pull a lady alive from the rubble in the collapsed Catholic church. And when she gets up, what are our first words? I love God Almighty. 
You instilled hope in somebody several thousand kilometers away. People will say, but you Christian, Jew, Muslim, are these creation created by some other God? Is there some other God that has made all the other nations? Or is the same God that made everybody? Does this God have only feelings for one kind of creation and no feelings for the other kind of creation? We need to get our principles fixed up. Allah has love and compassion for every creation, for the cat, for the dog, for the universe, for everyone, because he's Allah the Supreme, the Almighty, the All-Kind, All-Knowing, All-Seeing, All-Wise. That's his qualities. So when you go there, you instill faith in him in no other God. And the next thing she tells my team, I love you. What the teacher said, the principle of love. But then we see the bad practice of greedy, egoistic, selfish mankind. The earthquake was, the epicenter was in Port-au-Prince. It was 2.4 kilometers in the ground. But the problem was, and it was nine on the rectus scale. It wiped out 250,000 people in 40 seconds. But why did so many people die? So many people died not because of the earthquake. They died because of man. Because all the buildings were next to each other. No proper plans, no proper architecture, no proper engineering, no proper steel structure, no solid cement. Latas, as we say, shortcut job. How many of us do shortcut job in our business? And because of that, when one building went, every building went with it. Collapsed. Thousands died because of the selfishness of men and the greed of men. Those children could have been your children, could have been our families, our brothers and our sisters. Imagine that, you say, the building fell because somebody took a shortcut here. That was the first part of the problem. That was a local issue. My teams go to the church, and as the kids start coming in, the Africana guys, big size Africana guys who are involved in this paramedic business, and cut jaws of life and cut the cars and cut everything else, wash the floor, wash the wall, waiting to serve. And as the kids come in, they start tearing. Now, business, you're not allowed to be emotional. You're not supposed to cry. But they broke down. Why? Because some other team from some other northern country came, world-class people, first-class standards, and practiced amputation on those children, and they did it wrong. So if you cut the hand, we now have to cut above the elbow. If you cut the angle, we have to cut above the knee. Not one, hundreds of kids we had to do that to. After five or six, they couldn't take it anymore. That is suffering. We as Muslims are not supposed to cause suffering. We are supposed, it was not caused by Muslims. But as a human being, we are not supposed to cause Muslim suffering. We are there to bring relief, to help people, to assist people. So after they did it and they tell the child, now go home. And the child said, go home, where? No house, no parents, no family, no neighbor, no grandparents, no way to go, and nothing to eat, torn shirt, where they go. And the teams broke down, and you're complaining about things not going right in your country. There's far worse problems all over the world. Are you complaining because you can't make another 30 or 40 million extra a day or a year? You're complaining because you can't live in a more expensive house? Or you can't have a more extravagant lifestyle? What is the problem? What Allah has blessed you with, make it to fix the lot of people. As I'm speaking to you now, there's children dying of starvation in the Eastern Cape. Why are they dying of starvation? In a country that's got gold, diamonds, platinum, magnesium, and everything else. You know why? Because the parents don't take the children to the hospital in time. Why do they not take the children to hospital in time? Because it's quite normal for the parents to be hungry every day. So hunger is part of their life. So it's quite normal for them to be hungry. So if they're hungry, it's quite normal for the children to be hungry also. So they don't see the need to go to hospital. The difference is children die, adults can survive longer. And when they come to the hospital, it's too late, and the children die. Imagine your children died because of starvation. And you want to know how much zakat to give. We need to change our thinking. And we got involved with the Eastern Cape Health Department. We said, we'll hold your hand, we'll educate, we'll teach. And we started using a product called Easy Peanut Paste, made by a Norwegian company. It's got proteins, it's got energy, it's got micronutrients, and we gave it to the kids. 
and they started eating it and they started loving it. And we gave it to the adults who were hungry too. See how Allah works. The Quran is clear that when you get good, you get good in return. When you do good, you get good in return. The company that made the product saw it on our social media pages and said, we appreciate what you guys are doing for the people of South Africa. Norwegian company. And said, we will send you some stuff. And they sent it here to Cape Town. 15 containers of easy, easy peanut paste. Value, 25 million rand. Non-Muslim company giving a Muslim organization, helping people in another country because they saw the value of what was being done and the difficulty of people, that, the difficulty that people went through. My final points when I finish off is that I always go back to how this started. Because you can't do anything without obedience. So I meet the spiritual teacher that night in August. And I see everything that's happening. And I see the love they're showing the people. And I go back and I stand in front of Rose Mubarak and I told Prophet Islam, I don't understand the study car business. If it's correct, I'd like to go back there. So I landed up back there, 6 August 1992. It was a Thursday night after Zikr at 10 o'clock. The Sheikh suddenly after Zikr looks up, makes eye contact with me. And in fluent Turkish, I don't speak a word of Turkish. But I understood everything that he said. He said, my son, I'm not asking you. I'm instructing you to form an organization. The name in Arabic will be Waqful Waqifin. Translated, gift of the givers. Again, these are important principles. You will serve all people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all cultures, of any geographical location and of any political affiliation, but you will serve them unconditionally. You will expect nothing in return, not even a thank you. In fact, in what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life, expect to get a kick up your back. If you don't get a kick up your back, regard it as a bonus. Serve people with love, kindness, compassion, and mercy. And remember, the dignity of men is foremost. Brothers and sisters, this country will not collapse because of hunger. It will not collapse because of racism. It will not collapse because of rich and poor, of the difference getting so wide. It will collapse when people have no dignity. When you are humiliated and you have no dignity and there are no consequences because you've lost everything, the amount of negative energy that will go into you to do negative things because you've got no hope, we can fix that. And we are fixing it. And who's coming to the fore? Corporate South Africa. They don't ask about the cut. They don't ask about the tax certificate. They don't ask for the BE points. They do what is expected of a human being. We've been taught. We got the book. We got instructions. We got the life. What are we doing about it? How much did we give for the fires in Cape? Six fires in one week. How much have we done? No, you'll ask and I take the cut. Those are the kind of questions you ask. How do you explain to a mother that your child fell down a pet toilet and died in feces? How will you expect that? If that happens to your child, what will you do? Go to hospital and there's no medication, no staff. One person got no hope of being seen like that man and his wife in Sibokeng Hospital. What do you do? Provide food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, naked, and in everything you are, do, be the best at what you do. Not because of ego. If anything destroys a country, a civilization, a community, a people, it's ego. We need to defeat that ego within ourselves. Not because of ego, but because you're dealing with human life, human emotion, human suffering, and human dignity. This is an instruction for you for the rest of your life. I was 30 years old at that time. And then he said the most important thing of all. He said, my son, whatever you do is done through you and not by you. 30 years, there's no way we can do the kind of things that we did. I'm going to give you one spiritual example about the power of what the Sheikh has said. You see, I walked into Syria. I came to a place called Darkush. I went to many other places. 
And every year when I couldn't find medical teams, my heart told you, don't go here, don't do this, don't do this. Prophet Islam said, when you're not sure of something, listen to your heart. So I was just saying no negative things all the time. Till I got to this place called Darkush. I couldn't find anybody. I was sad. I can't have the Syrian people. I'm walking out. As I'm walking out, I see a man talking. They say, there's a doctor. So he comes to me. Islam's brother, how are you? Are you speak English? Yes, what's your name? Dr. Ahmed Gandur, what do you do? I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon, but now I do everything. I work in the cave, I work in the mountain, I save lives, this is what I do. So I said, is there a building here which we can convert into a medical, emergency medical facility? Yes, you got the right one, let's just go. Takes me down in the street, 10 days before, they liberated the city from Assad's people. Go to the building, I said, this building was built for old people. Where in the Muslim world, old people are gonna stay in old age home? I said, nobody came, building is empty. So I looked at the building, I said, my friend, this building is too small for what we got in mind here. But he said, but you haven't even started. I said, we give for the givers, this thing's gonna be too small. He said, okay, let's do it. So then he said, what do you need? I said, I need to know, we need an engineer. Can we go upwards, backwards, forwards, sideways, and across the road on the other side there? So whilst we were walking, because now I had the gift shirt on, and my friend was with me, as we walked through the building, Ahmed Bam, we were together in the hospital, in this, in this building that's supposed to be the hospital. And other people are very curious who's this foreigner here, because every foreigner is like a traitor or a threat or a spy or something. So we walk inside and they see me and the guy said, I'm sorry, but I overheard you talking that you need an engineer. I'm an engineer. So I said, you speak English also? He said, yes. So I said, okay, tell us, can we go upwards, backwards, sideways and forwards? Yes, you can go up two floors. I said, oh, what kind of engineer are you? So he said, what do you mean? I said, where's the plan? Where's the drawing? Where's the steel structure? Where's the cement? How can you give an answer like that? This is my brother. Take it easy. I'm the guy that built this building. <laughs> That's not the point. This man left Darkush several years ago. 15 million people displaced in Syria internally and externally. The day I need an engineer, not any engineer, the engineer that built this building walks in at the same time. What's the chances of that happening from a human point of view? You have faith in spirituality. These are the kind of things that happen. And we took the land across the road and we took five other buildings and it's the largest functional hospital in North Syria today. There your Zakat is working very good, thank you. It's that kind of feeling and faith when you serve people, the help of Allah comes. Yes, it's not easy. Test comes, trials come. The Prophet lost his children, Salaam. He lost Bibi Khatija. He lost everything. He lost his uncle. He lost his support. Allah says that everybody will go to the same system. We will have challenges. We will have hardships. We will have difficulty. There's only one way to do this, the right way. Spirituality, morality, values, and ethics. Change our thinking. Let's fix our country together. Our people need our help first. And the final point is, that man that came with his son to the office is what we need to go back to. You see in the old days, I come from Pajastrum again. In the old days in Pajastrum, if somebody was naughty, and you come and tell your, the father, you know, your, your son was naughty, he said, why are you telling me, give him two shots? You tell him that? Your son is my son. Try doing that today. Try doing that today. Mind your own business. Got nothing to do with you. It's not your son. It's my son. There's the ego of our people. The ego that is destroying our kids on drugs and every type of wrong thing. Because you are too proud and arrogant to extrude the messenger in the foot rather than fix the problem. And we'll say, and the community will stand together and everybody would go to the funeral together, go to the wedding together even though they're not invited. They'll go and help. And that was that love. Today the love is materialism. It's money, it's pride, it's power, it's ego. If I give you two billion rand now, and say all of you have two billion rand, please tell me how many lifetimes you're gonna to need to spend it. You'll die several times over and you won't be able to spend that money. What you, what you don't use is not yours. So rather take it and spend it on someone else so when you get on the other side, something good is waiting for you. Jazakallah, Assalamu alaikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Ich sehe Sie mal auch hier und zu Dr. Suleiman, Founder and Chairperson of the Wakful Waqifin, Gift of the Givers. And the uh, Zakum Allah for bringing reality to us, and I'm sure that is not even the tip of the iceberg that is happening outside the. So may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless Dr. Grant him a long life, healthy life, to continue with the good works Dr. is doing. Inshallah, we make du'a for Dr. Sadiq Parker, who is currently in the GMC Malumit Cageville uh, Hospital. It's not doing too well. We make du'a to Allah subhanahu wa taala grant Dr. Sadiq uh, Shifa, Shifa and Kamilan, complete Shifa, grant him comfort and also. Uh, is and sabr to the family and friends. Amen, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Jazakumullah khairan. And one point Dr. raised was that Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayyiru ma bi anfusim. Let us make the change. Allah will never change the condition of the people until the people change it themselves. We make that intention today, inshallah, that we are going to try to change our condition to the better. Amen, Ya Rabbul Alameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Quite a few people are standing outside, both sides, with all the doors. Can we just ask the brothers to stand in fadlik? to stand and to fill all the tiny gaps, just to fill it with fadlik, so that everyone can come inside the masjid, insha'Allah. Jazakumullah khairan. On your left-hand side as well, brothers, you have people standing at the door, and in the front as well. Jazakumullah khairan. Fadim.
الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله شريك له هو الأول والآخر والظاهر والباطن وهو على كل شيء قدير ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا ومولانا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه نشهد أنه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى أتاه اليقين فجازه اللهم خير ما جزيت النبي عن أمته ورسولا عن رسالته ورض اللهم عن صحابته الطيبين الطاهرين وعنا معهم إلى يوم الدين وبعد عباد الله تعالى أصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله سبحانه وتبارك وتعالى قال تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون وقال تعالى إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن العظيم وهداني وإياكم من الطريق المستقيم يقول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم التائب من الذنب كمن لا ذنب له والتائب حبيب الرحمن فتوبوا إلى الله واستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله, استغفر الله, استغفر الله <تصفيق> الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أحمده سبحانه وتبارك وتعالى وأشكره وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فيا عباد الله اتقوا الله سبحانه وتبارك وتعالى 
قال تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا في عباد الله صلوا على رسول الهدي محمد خير خلق الله فقد امنتم بذلك في كتاب الله قال تعالى ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من صلى عليها مرة واحدة صلى الله عليه بها عشرة اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما باركت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وارض اللهم عن خلفائه الأربعة أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي وعن الصحابة والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم عز الإسلام وانصر المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام وانصر المسلمين اللهم عز الإسلام وانصر المسلمين اللهم ألف بين قلوب المسلمين ووحد صفوفهم واصل قادتهم واجمع كلمتهم الحق يا مولانا يا رب العالمين اللهم آمنا في أوطاننا اللهم آمنا في أوطاننا اللهم آمنا في أوطاننا واصلح إمتنا وولاة أمورنا واجعل ولايتنا في من خافك واتقاك يا مولانا يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك يا الله سميع قريب مجيب دعوات ويا قاضي الحاجات ويا رب المعجزات استجب بفضلك دعاءنا ولا تخيف فيك رجاءنا واشفنا واشف مرضانا وارحم موتانا وأهلك عداءنا ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار أدخلنا الجنة مع الأبرار يا عزيز يا غفار يا مولانا يا رب العالمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفخشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروا على نعمه يزدكم واسألوه من فضله يعطكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون قوموا إلى الصلاة لكم يرحمنا ويرحمكم الله And just ask once again the people to fill the gaps in فضله Stand shoulder to shoulder. Try to keep the rows as straight as possible. الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين 
اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا والصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين ولا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المهتدون الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا وإذا ما أنزلت سورة نظر بعضهم إلى بعض هل يراكم من أحد ثم صرفوا صرف الله قلوبهم بأنهم قوم لا يفقهون لقد جاءكم رسول من أنفسكم عزيز عليه ما عنتم حريص عليكم بالمؤمنين رؤوف رحيم فإن تولوا فقل حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم الله أكبر الله 
الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله العظيم استغفر الله العظيم استغفر الله العظيم التواب الرحيم الذي لا إله إلا هو الحي القيوم ونتوب إليه ونسلك يا رب توبة ونغفرة ونداية لنا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وأصحابه وبارك وسلم اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام سمعنا وأطعنا وفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم رب الناس أذم البأس اشفي أنت الشافي لا شفاء إلا شفاءك شفاء لا يغادر سقما ولا أدما نسأل الله الكريم رب العرش العظيم أن يشفينا واشف مرضى المسلمين جميعا برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين وقال تعالى وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا يزيد الظالمين إلا خسارا ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا واغفر لنا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم اللهم عنا على ذكرك وشكرك وحسن عبادتك سبحان ربنا رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين لا إله إلا الله